The F-35's combination of advanced weapons, avionics, and stealth will help it ensure its success over the battlefields of the future. U.S. military planners wondered if these same features could be utilized in a helicopter. They wanted a stealth helicopter. But could it be done? Over the last 50 years, helicopters have evolved from slow-moving multi-purpose support vehicles to fast-moving frontline attack ships. But in the high-tech wars of the future, speed alone is not enough. Information is the key. There's three elements that are critical to warfare. The ability for you to know more than the enemy, the ability to maneuver quickly uh, around an enemy and gather more information about them, and the ability to provide precision firepower at the enemy. In future conflicts, after the F-22 Raptors and the F-35 Joint Strike Fighters have cleared the way, surveillance and attack helicopters will support ground troops as they move in to secure the area. We like to be down low where the action is, and we like to be down low where the threat can't see us. But at such low altitudes, helicopters are vulnerable to a wide assortment of ground-to-air weapons. All the simple systems, the guns, unguided rockets, the surface-to-air missiles, it's got to deal with all of that, and it's got to deal all of it effectively. The Pentagon has responded with a two-pronged strategy to counter this threat. Inexpensive, expendable, unmanned helicopters and stealthy manned helicopters. Unmanned helicopters will be primarily used for surveillance and for gathering targeting information. Fire Scout, designed by Northrop Grumman, was specifically developed to take off and land on Navy ships. However, the key to creating a successful manned helicopter for future combat is to make it stealthy like the F-22. But the question is, can it be done? Achieving stealth in a helicopter is different from stealth in a fixed-wing aircraft. You're concerned about different signatures, radar reflectivity, infrared, noise, all the things that will give away an aircraft's position. Those signatures, like heat, smoke, and sound, put helicopters and their pilots at serious risk over the battlefield. All the small shoulder-fired missiles, which are very effective against helicopters, are heat-seeking infrared systems. The challenge for engineers was to create a quiet helicopter with very few signatures and a small radar cross-section. And that's exactly what Sikorsky has done with the new RAH-66 Comanche. In the Comanche, with all the stealth capabilities, we can defeat the radar threat. We can defeat the guy with the shoulder-launched heat-seeking missile. And from the guy popping up in the tree, our agility defeats him. Our small size, our quiet acoustic signature defeats him. Often, the first thing you hear from a helicopter is the sound of the wake from the main rotor hitting the wake from the tail rotor. In the Comanche, the fan tail is shrouded, so there is no interaction between the fan blade tips and the main rotor tips, and it's also canted slightly. And those all contribute to reducing the acoustic signature. Engineers also experimented with the main rotor to find a quieter design. If you look at a Comanche, it's got a five-blade rotor. And what that does is it uh, cuts down the normal chop, chop, chop sound from a helicopter into a more discreet whir that kind of blends into the background. Reducing the heat signature of a helicopter is also essential to making it more survivable. When you look at a Comanche, uh, the first thing you ask yourself is, where's the exhaust? Where does all this hot air get out of the engine? The Comanche's exhaust actually escapes through the tail boom, where it is instantly dispersed by cool air from the rotor. That missile has to have something to home in on, and that's a heat signature. Comanche defeats that by the engine exhaust being mixed with ambient air and cooling it so that there's no longer a heat plume for that missile to home in on. To defeat radar, the Comanche utilized the stealth secrets first developed for the F-117 Nighthawk. There are no radar reflecting right angles on its outer fuselage, 
and all weapons are carried internally to help keep its stealthy shape. What's interesting about the helicopter is some of the things that achieve stealth actually make the helicopter better. Things like the retractable landing gear and the retractable weapons bays, that also makes it sleeker and faster. So once you've bought into the stealth part of it, you get other superior attributes. The main role of the Comanche is to give commanders an overview of the battlefield by providing up-to-the-minute information. Comanche is going to be basically their flying cavalryman. It's going to dart in and out, slash and cut, be a reconnaissance vehicle. As Comanche's two pilots gather data, their computer shares that data with other allied forces. When the Comanche finds the enemy, he's going to kind of direct like a quarterback to apply the firepower to defeat that enemy. Engineering advances have also made the Comanche one of the easiest and most forgiving helicopters to fly. One thing the Comanche brings that other previous generation helicopters can't bring to the table is the pilot can maneuver the Comanche in virtually any axis without fear of exceeding any limits. Although it will be used primarily for reconnaissance, the Comanche will also be armed for self-defense. The Comanche is capable of carrying a wide array of weapons all the way from guided missiles using a laser guidance system, uh, heat-seeking missiles, which would be more of an air-to-air -air weapon, or unguided rockets, and also the latest Hellfire is pretty much a fire and forget. In addition, Comanche's pilots can ask Allied aircraft to fire missiles their way, and can then take over and guide those missiles to their targets. If the Comanche is hit, its computer system can often fix itself by reassigning vital functions to undamaged computer cards. This is where the computer brain of the Comanche is. In support of its reconnaissance mission, Comanche can control as many as five unmanned aircraft. When the Comanche may be employed, it may have little vehicles that it launches out, so it has its own little eyes over the hill so it can see what's going on without putting itself at risk. In addition to launching its own unmanned air vehicles, Comanches may be aided on the battlefield by swarms of LOCAS, small intelligent missiles with their own computer brains. It's about 31 inches long, weighs a little over 100 pounds, carries a single warhead, has a laser radar. In other words, it has a scanning laser beam that generates pictures. The LOCAS also communicate with each other and cooperate in searches and attacks. You could have a swarm of LOCASs, each of which has its own eyes, each of which is thinking, but each of which is com communicating with each other send that imagery back to the operators who could either use these as surveillance probes or, in fact, as weapons themselves. Weapons like LOCAS reflect the trend toward electronically linking all allied forces and weapons so that information can be shared and used by all. By networking aircraft over the battlefield, with surveillance platforms and other weapon systems, commanders can quickly change missions to take advantage of up-to-the-minute information. The key to the air battle of the future is not necessarily stealth, speed, or firepower. It's going to be information. Unmanned air vehicles, or UAVs, will provide a large part of that information while flying long-duration surveillance missions. So, will the Air Force of the future have no pilots? Since the very first use of airplanes in war, military planners have looked for ways to make aircraft more effective and more lethal. Once so secret their very existence was denied by the government, unmanned air combat vehicles, or UCAVs, are now poised to take the preeminent role in 21st century air combat. UAVs are certainly going to change air power in the 21st century. 
You can see it starting to happen today, but what we're looking at now is just the beginning because there's going to be more of them and they're going to be better. Unmanned aerial vehicles allow the military to do more with less, to put more aircraft into the air than you otherwise would be able to because of the limited number of pilots that you might have or where it might be too risky. In the future, aircraft that have no pilots on board will carry out the most dangerous combat missions. Today, unmanned air vehicles, or UAVs, are already taking over the role of long-duration surveillance. UAVs don't have mothers. You lose a UAV in combat and nobody bats an eyelid. One of the earliest surveillance UAVs was the Predator. It was developed in the early 1990s. When you look at Predator, basically they start off as being long endurance systems that can really persist over the battlefield. In Afghanistan, Predators provided critical real-time intelligence. And it was there that a Predator made an amazing transformation from surveillance to armed aerial attack. The power to help our missile, an Al-Qaeda convoy, and destroyed one of the vehicles in there. And at that point, it crossed the line from an unmanned aerial vehicle into an unmanned combat aerial vehicle. Today, the new Predator B can carry up to 10 Hellfire missiles. Of course, its primary mission is still what the military refers to as ISR, or Information, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. It's basically a poor man's satellite. I mean, you can bring it in and, uh, and, and let it dwell in an area. UAVs transmit important visual information to battlefield commanders via satellite or other data links. Once targets had been located, identified, and cataloged, these could be disseminated to other weapons or weapon systems. Reconnaissance UAVs have multiple ways of conducting surveillance. On clear days, they use specially stabilized optical lenses that can zoom to high magnification. At night, they use infrared, and under adverse conditions, they use synthetic aperture radar to pierce the thickest clouds, sandstorms, or oil field smoke. When the radar is reflected back, it can also be used to create a 3D image of objects. If the enemy chooses to use countermeasures or decoys or deception techniques, Having to beat three systems is a lot harder than one. The success of the Predator paved the way for the development of an even more advanced high-altitude jet-powered UAV by Northrop Grumman. It's called the Global Hawk, but unlike the Predator, it was designed to take off, fly its pre-programmed mission, and land all on its own, thanks to the GPS, or Global Positioning Satellite System. The Global Hawk is basically a much larger version of the Predator. It has higher altitude capabilities, increased payload. It can carry a lot more sensors, a lot more communication devices, and it can loiter over a battlefield for up to 35 hours. The Global Hawk can stay aloft for a day or more, providing constant near real-time video surveillance over an area the size of Illinois. Predator and Global Hawk give us an up-close view which is something you can't get from a national asset, which would be a satellite type of thing. Though still in development, the Global Hawk had a dramatic impact during Operation Iraqi Freedom. A single prototype provided information to Allied forces on 55% of all time-sensitive targets, including mobile Scud missile launchers. 